In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Good day to you, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jake Johnson coming to you live from the internet, streaming from random parts of the world. This is Untethered Livestream, and you're watching the deep end of a Bible study. Won't you come with me? Won't you join me as we go together off the deep end? Today, we are in the book of Numbers, and we're going to be continuing from last week, where we just started out in Numbers, and we got a pretty good little ways into the first chapter, but we're going to continue on and see how far we can get through this letter. This is a letter written by Paul to certain people. Uh, the last book was to the Corinthians. This letter is to other people. And we'll get into that as we go. How are things going on in your neck of the woods? Is it raining? Is it shining? Is it snowing? Could it be other things? Could be bad. You never know. Either way, things are beautiful here. It's been a bright, sunny day all day. No rain, nowhere. Wonderful. As opposed to Friday when I got caught in the rain, freezing rain. April, Great Sky Troll, what's happening, guys? Your signal is cheddar, cheese-based connection. It's beautiful here in Florida, says April. Well, that's wonderful. It's good news. It's good to be in good weather. It makes the spirit perk up a little bit. There's nothing worse than a dreary day on a dreary mind in a dreary little world in a dreary place. And then you're just going, Ugh. but when it's nice and sunny out, you get up and you get busy. You're in a hammock. Well, that sounds fun. Does this feel better to you now? Welcome to the hammock stream. I'm your host, Jake Johnson. What do you think? We could do a whole stream like that. Get Just getting ready. Where are you getting ready to go? Five feet. Five feet, not foot. There's a Kevin. What's happening, my friend? I am listening with my new Georgia Bulldogs headphones. Woo! What a fashion statement. Go dogs! As am I, my friend. I'm listening with my Caliphone headphones. I think that's what they're called. Caliphone, for your listening pleasure. Go dogs, as it were. <coughs> anyway, we're going to get into some good stuff tonight. Good old numbers. I can't do anything without numbers. I'm pretty sure that's not what the book's about, but we'll get there. Everybody ready to have a good time? Is Darlene coming on tonight? I hadn't seen her in a while. Woof, woof, woof. Hunker down. Got to hunker down and learn some Bible in your brain. And me, I'm really the guy you want to get it from. You don't want some pencil neck nerd that's never experienced anything in the world to tell you what's right and wrong. You want a guy who's been there. You want a guy who's been road hard and put up wet to say, hey, ding bat, don't do that. That's what you want. 
And that's what I provide. Or better yet, it's okay to do that. I know what your parents said, but trust me on this. It's okay. How do I know? Because God told you to do it. And if he tells you to do it, it's okay. You have a bibliography? Really? Somebody wrote about your life in chronological order? Because that's what a bibliography is. It's not about the Bible. Bible means book. Hey, hilarious great sky troll. I'm just listening on phone speakers. La 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 la. She's not feeling that great. She turned down red lob she turned down red lobster jesus christ you need to go check on her things you've referenced for your writing yeah there you go that's more correct sounds good what are you writing by the way i'd be interested to know you're one of the most well-read people i know aside from myself and that's a stretch because my reading is very sporadic but uh I would be interested to see what you were writing about. I've threatened to write a book many times, but every time I try, the paper catches on fire. Who are you? Where is April? Oh. Nope, that's April. You read? I know. That's what I just said. You're one of the most well-read people I know. I'm not sure about the content of what you're reading, but you've done a lot of it. She got the shot. I would have, if she'd have came on here, I would have talked her out of it. Well, no, it ain't never dumb. If you're writing it, that means it's coming from you. That's not dumb at all. Legion Machine. Is that like Deus Ex Machina? Is that multiple demons inside of a machine? You never know about a feller. I don't think that's dumb, though. I think it's interesting. You go, boy. Keep writing. Might make a scholar out of you yet. A gentleman and a scholar. Okie dokie, then. I think we're about deep as we're going to get for the time being, so uh, if you got your Bibles handy, pull them out and turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 54. I did that backwards. It's okay. 54, 45, either one. We'll get there. <coughs> now you sound like Fritz. Love it. I sound like Fritz? Wow. Well, I only lived with him for 30 years, maybe. With him cloning himself a thousand times. Oh, it's a Joe Blow who gets abducted and hilarity ensues. And he clones himself a thousand times, ten thousand times. Well, it's got to be a pretty crappy copy by then. Think multiplicity, but if you're cloned. I think multiplicity was cloning. I hadn't seen that movie in a long time, but I think it was based on cloning. Some kind of carbon copying anyway. That would be a legion. 10,000 strong. Okie dokie. Let's get into it, shall we, folks? I littleized myself so that I can wordize the screen. Words? 
There you are. I was cloned? I don't know if I was cloned or not. I think I'd remember that. I think I, I think I thought I was cloned once, but it turned out I just had a bad case of mono. All right, time to get serious. That's why we came here. And Numbers chapter 1, verse 54. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so, they, so did they. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard. That's a uh, flag, by the way, standard. That's the symbol that means the tribe that they're in. It's called a standard. Our flag with the stars and bars is our standard. With the ensign of their father's house. The ensign is the signal or the symbol that's on the standard. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. Now if you were looking at them standing on top of a big hill looking down at the tabernacle and the tabernacle was in the center, the camps would form a cross around the tabernacle. Not because they thought it looked Christian. You know, it's just the nature of north, south, east, and west. They'd have a camp at the top and a camp at the bottom and a camp on either side and then small camps around inside of the angles, if you could picture that. That's how the camps would set up. And there's 12 of them, so you could figure out where they go based on that. And one of them is extra large, so they're down at the bottom. And that's how they would pitch their, t their camps as they would move throughout the desert, carrying the tabernacle with them as they went. You know, it was portable. It was designed to be tore down and packed up and carried along. Okay. And on the east side, toward the rising sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch, that's the lion, that's the king line of the twelve tribes, throughout their armies, Nashon, the sons of Amenadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. And they were quite a formidable army, if you might read later on in the Bible. And his host. Let me get make sure I didn't skip a page there. Yeah. And his host. And those that were numbered of them were three score and fourteen thousand and six hundred. That's a lot of men. And those that do pitch next unto him shall be the tribe of Issachar. And Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, shall be captain of the children of Issachar. Also a formidable army. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were fifty and four thousand and four hundred. Then the tribes of Zebulon, or Zebulun, Zebulon is in Florida, Zebulun is a tribe. And Eliab, the son of Helen, shall be captain of the children of Zebulun. And his host, and those that were numbered thereof, were fifty and seven thousand and four hundred. All that were numbered in the camp of Judah were an hundred thousand and fourscore thousand and six thousand and four hundred. Try to write that number down. Whew. Throughout their armies, these shall first set forth. On the south side shall there be a standard of the camp of Reuben, according to their armies, and the captain of the children of Reuben shall be Elizer, son of Shadir, 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 he was French, Shadir, <laughs> and his hosts, and those that were numbered thereof were forty and six thousand and five hundred, and those which pitch by him shall be the tribe of Simeon, and the captain of the children of Simeon shall be Shalumiel, Shalumiel, the son of Jerishadai, Jerishadai. Man, the names in this Bible, and his son and his hosts and those that were numbered of them were fifty and nine thousand and three hundred. Then the tribe of Gad and the captain of the sons of Gad shall be Elisaphath, Elisaphath, Fath, Elisaph, that's it, Elisaph, the son of Ruel. 
and his host, and those that were numbered of them, were forty and five thousand and six hundred and fifty. All that were numbered in the camp of Reuben were an hundred thousand and fifty, and one thousand and four hundred and fifty throughout their armies, and they shall set forth in the second rank. That is the second wave of army. They're building an army here. Then the tabernacle of the congregation shall set forward with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camp. That's in the very center where the tabernacle is. And they in camp, so shall they set forward, every man in his place by their standards. On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim, according to their armies. And the captain of the sons of Ephraim shall be Elishama, the sons of Amenahud, the son of Amenahud, and his hosts and those that were numbered of them were 40,500. See, they're getting a little smaller as they go back further. And by him shall be the tribe of Manasseh, and the captain of the children of Manasseh shall be Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur, Pedazur. And his hosts and those that were numbered of them were thirty and two thousand and two hundred, and the tribe of Benjamin, the small group. The captain of the sons of Benjamin shall be Abidan, or Abidan, however you want to say that, Abidan. I'm, I got Biden in my head. It's Abidan, the son of Gideon, Gideoni. And his hosts and those that were numbered of them were thirty and five thousand and four hundred. All that were numbered of the camp of Ephraim were an hundred thousand and eight thousand and an hundred throughout their armies. And they shall go forth word, and they shall go forward in the third rank. That's the third p pillar of soldiers. Or third row of soldiers. The standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side by their armies. And the captain of the children of Dan shall be Ahizer, the son of Amenishabi, Amenishadai, that's it, Amishadai, that's it, Amishadai, Jesus. Why can't all names have two syllables? Amishadai. And his hosts, and those that were numbered of them, were threescore and two thousand and seven hundred. And those that encamp by him shall be the tribe of Asher. And the tribe of the children of Asher shall be Pegiel, son of Ochran. And his hosts and those that were numbered of them were forty and one thousand and five hundred. And the tribe of Naphtali and the captains of the children of Naphtali shall be Ahira, the son of Enon, Ashal. And his hosts and those that were numbered of them were fifty and three thousand and four hundred. All they that were numbered in the camp of Dan were, were an hundred thousand and fifty and seven thousand and six hundred. They shall go hindmost, that's in the back, with their standards. The tribe of Dan in the back because they're the smallest. Now. If you picture this army with all those thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of men, there are four rows, like waves of just an impenetrable army of big, strong, tough guys. You should have seen those guys back then. They were huge, big boys. They eat lots of greens. And the smallest of them, which numbered in the thousands, in the back tribe of Dan, small tribe, Benjamin a small tribe, but Dan the smallest. He only had two children who sprang off and made many, 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 many children. They were very fertile in those days. But if you could imagine that army coming at you, you would not want to fight very long because these boys would roll, steamroll over the competition as long as God set them forth, by the way. Anytime they ever tried to fight a battle on their own, they lost. But anytime God sanctioned it, they had right on their side and they conquered every time. So let that be a lesson to you. If you're going to take on a battle, make sure God sends you to do it. <clears throat> These are those which were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers. 
and those that were numbered of the camps throughout their host were six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty. But the Levites were not numbered among the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses. They're to be set aside because the Levites are the priest line. Remember I told you Judah was the king line, Levi is the priest line, and this will come into importance later on down the road when we start talking about Jesus. Because Jesus' mother Mary was a full-blooded Levite and a full-blooded Jew, 50-50 because her father was full-blooded Jew and her mother was full-blooded Levite, meaning her mother was a priestess and her father was a king, King Heli to be exact. And they bore Mary, and her blood was perfect, priest and king, which is why God saw her as favorable, why he picked her out of the crowd, because no one else on earth had that pedigree at that time except for Mary which is why she was favored, not because she was a 13-year-old hottie, like some people like to think, but because she had perfect blood. It couldn't have been more perfect. The timing was exact down to the science. God had it all planned out from the very beginning, even back when he was talking to Abraham. When he told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, he was doing that because he wanted to see if Isaac would sacrifice, I mean, Abraham would sacrifice Isaac. And when he saw that he would, he put a stop to it. He didn't let it happen. So the reason he did that was because he was already thinking about what he had to do with Christ later on down the line. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they pitched by their standards. So they set forward everyone after his families according to the house of their fathers. These also are the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spake with Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, and Elizer, and Ithamar. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. And Nadab and, Abid and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness. That means they brought fire into the camp that didn't belong to the camp. Knowing that they weren't supposed to, they did it anyway, and they paid the price with their lives. This was talked about two books ago when we were talking about it <laughs> of Sinai, in the wilderness of Sinai. And they had no children. And Eleazar and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron and their father. Aaron is their father. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister unto him. And they shall keep his charge, and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation, to do the service of the tabernacle. That was what they were charged with doing taking care of the tabernacle, doing the business, making sure everything was stocked up, making sure it was clean and always open and always inviting. That's the Levite's position in this whole thing. And they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and charge the, the uh, children of Israel and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. That means they are completely his to do with as he wishes, which is to keep the tabernacle running. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. They don't like strangers. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And I, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix, which means they were born through the mother, the matrix being the womb, among the children of Israel. Before the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel both man and beast, 
mine shall they be. I am the Lord. Apparently he's pretty serious about it. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the children of Levi after the house of their fathers, by their families, every male from a month old and upward shalt thou number them. And Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord. That's all capital letters, by the way. That's God himself speaking to Moses as he was commanded. And these were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon and Kohath and Merari, 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 Kohath and Merari. That sounds like a detective team in the 70s. Da -da 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 -da, Kohath and Merari. And these are the names of the son of Gershon by their families, Libni and Shemi. And the sons of Kohath by their families, Amram and Ezahar, Hebron and Uziel. And the sons of Merari by their families, Machli and Mushi. These were Hawaiians. These are the families of the Levites according to the house of their fathers. Of Gershon was the family of the Libnites and the family of the Shemites. These are the families of the Gershonites. Why is this important? Because if you're looking at a map and you're trying to understand how things spread out, it's good to know who was where and when and why. That way you can understand the story as a whole as it's being told. Now, I know this is a little hard to grasp while you're trying to keep it all in your mind, but it does have purpose, and it is suitable for you to at least hear it once, even if you don't retain it, because it's really not important if you're not looking at it in a historical factor, but it is important to know where everyone came from. So that's why this chapter is here, even though it's a little hard to slog through. Those that were numbered of them, according to the number of all the males from a month old and upward, even those that were numbered of them were 7,500. The families of the Gershonites shall pitch behind the tabernacle westward, and the chief of the house of the father of the Gershonites shall be Eliasaph, the son of Lael. And the charge of the sons of Gershon in the tabernacle of the congregation shall be the tabernacle and the tent and the covering thereof and the hanging of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the hangings in, of the court and the curtain for the door of the court, which is by the tabernacle and by the altar round about and the cords of it all the service thereof. That's what that family takes care of as far as the tabernacle goes. This is laying out the jobs of the different people that were all collectively charged to take care of the tabernacle. It was divided into like, you know, chores. So these are the Gershon's chores, and then we'll get into the other people's chores. And as, as they work together as a team, they keep the whole tabernacle running nice and neat. And of Kohath was the family of the Amramites, and the family of the Izharites, and the family of the Hebronites, and the family of the Uzalites. These are the families of the Kohathites. If you ever wondered what a Kohathite was, now you know. In the number of all the males from a month old and upward were 8,600 keeping the charge of the sanctuary, and the families of the sons of Kohath shall pitch on the side of the tabernacle southward. And the chief of the house of the father of the families of the Kohathites ba -da -ba -da 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 -ba -ba, shall be Elisaphan, the son of Uziel. <laughs> Their charge shall be the ark, and the table, and the candlestick, and the altars, and the vessels of the sanctuary wherewith they minister, and the hangings, and all the service thereof. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, shall be chief over the chief of the Levites. So he's the chief's chief. Chiefly chieftain, 
of the Chiefs. Chiefers. Shall have the oversight of them that keep the charge of the sanctuary. And of Marari was the family of the Mahites, Malhites, Malites. They went to the Mall a lot. And the family of the Mushites. These are the families of Marari, and those that were numbered of them according to the number of all the males from a month old and upward were six thousand and two hundred. And the chief of the house of the father of the families of Marari was Zuriel, the son of Ab Ab Abihel. These shall pitch on the sides of the tabernacle northwards, that's at the top, and under the custody and charge of the sons of Merari shall be the boards of the tabernacle, and the bars thereof, and the pillars thereof, and the sockets thereof, and the, all the vessels thereof, and all, the serve, ser, all that serveth thereto, and the pillars of the court round about, and their sockets, and their pins, and their cords. But those that encamp before the tabernacle towards the east, even before the tabernacle of the congregation eastward, shall be Moses and Aaron and his sons, keeping the charge of the sanctuary for the charge of the children of Israel, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Let's not forget that part. <laughs> no matter what I tell you at the end of it, if any strangers come along, put them to death. All that were numbered of the Levites, which Moses and Aaron numbered at the commandment of the Lord, throughout their families, all the males from a month old and upward, were twenty and two thousand. And the Lord said unto Moses, Number all the firstborn of the males of the children of Israel from a month old and upward, and take the number of their names. And thou shalt take the Levites for me, I am the Lord, instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites, instead of all the firstlings, among the cattle of the children of Israel. And Moses numbered, as the Lord commanded him, all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and all the firstborn males by their numbers of names, by the number of names, from a month old and upward. Of those that were numbered of them were twenty and two thousand and two hundred and threescore and thirteen. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle, and the Levites shall be mine. I am the Lord. And for those that are to be redeemed of the two hundred and threescore and thirteen of the firstborn of the children of Israel, which are more than the Levites, Thou shalt even take five shekels apiece by the pole. After the shekel of the sanctuary, thou shalt take them. The shekel is twenty geras, which is, you know, more than a shekel. No, a shekel is more than a gera. Take twenty geras that makes one shekel. I don't know how much twenty shekels makes, but I'm thinking maybe a talon. Who knows? And thou shalt give the money wherewith the odd number of them is to be redeemed unto Aaron and his sons. They got to make a living too, yo. And Moses took the redemption money of them that were over and above them that were redeemed by the Levites of the firstborn of the children of Israel, took he the money. A thousand three hundred and three score and five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, meaning that's how much the shekel was valued at, is whatever the standard shekel of the sanctuary, if they called that, say, worth a dollar, then all shekels would be considered worth a dollar if the sanctuary dollar was a shekel. You understand? It's like ways and measures of the old days. A little different than now, but now we have money that's based on fake gold that doesn't exist. Oh, did I say that? I'm sorry. It's just paper, folks. Doesn't mean anything. Has no value at all. The only reason it has value is because you think it does. You're welcome, America. Wake up, America. And Moses gave the money of them that were redeemed unto Aaron and his sons according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, after their families, by the house of their fathers, from thirty years old and upwards, even until fifty years old, and all that enter into the host, to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the old people get to clean the place. Basically, they're the janitors. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath, in the tabernacle of the congregation, about the most holy things. And when the camp seeth, excuse me, when the camp setteth forward, Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it, and shall put thereon the covering of the badger's skins, and shall spread over it a cloth of holy blue, that means completely blue, not holy as in spiritual, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and shall put it, put in the staves thereof, the little poles that you pick it up with. He's telling them how to move it now. And upon the table of the showbread they shall spread a cloth of blue, and put thereon the dishes, and the spoons, and the bowls, and cover to cover with all. And the continual bread shall be thereon. And they shall, that's like uh, all you can eat wings, you know, never ending wings. It's continual bread, same thing, same principle. It's a buffet, folks. And they shall spread upon them the cloth of scarlet and cover the same with the covering of the badger's skins and shall put on the staves thereof, the poles that you pick it up with, and shall take a cloth of blue and cover the candlesticks of the light and his lamps and his tongs and his snuff dishes and the oil vessels thereof wherewith they minister unto, and they shall put it and all the vessels thereof within a covering of badger's skins, and shall put it upon the bar, upon a bar, and upon the golden altar shall they spread a cloth of blue, and cover it with the covering of badger's skins, and shall put it, and shall put to the staves thereof, poles you pick it up with, and they shall take all the instruments of the ministry wherewith they minister in the sanctuary and put them in a cloth of blue and cover them with a covering of badger's skins and shall put them on a bar and they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth thereon and they shall put upon it all the vessels thereof wherewith they minister about it even the censers, that's a vessel, even the flesh hooks, that's not a vessel, and the shovels, and the basins, that's a vessel, and all the vessels, which are vessels, of the altar, and they shall spread upon it the covering of badger's skins, and put to the staves of it, pick it up and move it along. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of the covering the sanctuary, and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward. After that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, pick it up and move it. But they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. You cannot touch any of the holy things. Even if you're a Levite, you're allowed to move it, but you're not allowed to touch it. That's what the staves are for. Keep a good distance. They, they were social distancing even back then, folks. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. It was not seen as a pleasant thing at all, but they had to do it. Somebody had to do it. And why couldn't they touch it? Does anybody know? Ten points for extra credit. Why could they not touch anything pertaining to the Ark of the Covenant? They were permitted to move it. They were charged with moving it but they were not allowed to touch it. Does anybody know why? <laughs> Nobody? Fine, don't play along. I'll do it all myself. I don't need your help. Because God told them, don't touch it. That's why. That's the only reason why. That's the only reason you need. Because God said, don't touch it. 
Don't look at it. Don't lick it. Don't think about licking it. And those of the office of Eleazar, the sons of Aaron, the priests, pertaineth to the oil for the light, and the sweet incense, and the daily meat offering, and the anointing oil, and the oversight of all the tabernacle, and of all that therein is, the sanctuary, and the vessels thereof. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Cut ye not off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites, but thus do unto them, that they may live and not die. When they approach unto the most holy things, Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint them every one his service and to his burden. But they shall not go in and see what the holy things are covered, lest they die. They can't watch it. They can't be part of it. All they can do is pick it up and move it. All, it's got to be completely covered with a covering that you cannot see through, which is why it was supposed to be completely blue or completely red and made of badgers, badgers skins. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take also the sum of the sons of Gershon throughout the houses of their families, by their families, throughout the houses of their fathers, by their families, from thirty years old and upwards until fifty years old, shalt thou number them. All that enter in to perform the service, to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. This is the service of the families of the Gershonites, to serve and for burdens. And they shall bear the curtains of the tabernacle, and the tabernacle of the congregation, his coverings, and the coverings of the badger's skins, that is above upon it, and the hanging for the door, of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the hangings of the court, and the hangings of the door for the gate of the court, which is by the tabernacle, and by the altar round about, and their cords, and all their instruments of their service, and all that is made for them, so they shall serve. Now have you ever felt like your job was a burden, or something you had to do that was part of your responsibility as a person? It's kind of a burden, it's kind of hard, it's something that that weighs on you, but you have to do it anyway? Imagine what these people must have felt, knowing that they had to perform this service, that if they did it wrong, they would die. Period. No redemption. End of discussion. If you do it wrong, you're dead. You have to do it right. And you have to do it. You can't say no, because this is put on your family to do. So think about that the next time you feel like, gosh, i got to go to work again. Jeez. It's so boring. Such a burden. Think about that. At least you don't die if you screw it up. At the appointment of Aaron and his sons shall be all the service of the sons of the Gershonites in all their burdens and in all their service, and ye shall appoint unto them in charge all their burdens. This is the service of the families of the sons of Gershon in the tabernacle of the congregation, and their charge shall be under the hand of Ithamar, and the thun the thun the ver Ithamar the thun the Varen the priest. As for the sons of Merari, thou shalt number them and their families by the house of their fathers from thirty years old and upward, even unto fifty years old, shalt thou number them. Every one that entereth into the service to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and this is the charge of their burden, according to all their services in the tabernacle of the congregation, the boards of the tabernacle, and the bars thereof, and the pillars thereof, and the so sockets thereof, and the pillars of the court round about, and their sockets, and their pens, and their cords, with all their instruments, and with all their service. And by name ye shall reckon the instruments of the charge of their burdens. And this is the service of the families of the sons of Merari, according to all their service in the tabernacle of the congregation, under the hand of Ithamar, the Thunderverin, the priest. 
And Moses and Aaron and the chief of the congregation numbered the sons of the Kohathites after their families, after the house of their fathers, from thirty years old and upward even into fifty years old, every one that entereth into service for the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. And those that were numbered of them by their families were two thousand seven hundred and fifty. These were they that were numbered out of the families of the Kohathites, all that might do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, which Moses and Aaron did number according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And those that were numbered of the sons of Gershon throughout their families, and by the house of their fathers from thirty years old and upward, I feel like we've said this before, unto fifty years old, even one that entereth into service for the work in the tabernacle of the congregation, even those that were numbered of them throughout their families by the house of their fathers were 2,630. These are they that were numbered of the families of the sons of Gershon, of all that might do service in the tabernacle of the congregation, whom Moses and Aaron did number according to the commandment of the Lord, and those that were numbered of the families of the sons of Merari throughout their families, by the house of their fathers, from thirty years old upward even into fifty years old. Yeah, I'm certain we've said this before. Even one that entereth into the service of the work of the, in the tabernacle of the congregation, even those that were numbered of them after their families, were three thousand and two hundred. These be those that were numbered of the families of the sons of Merari, whom Moses and Aaron numbered according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses, and all those that were numbered of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron and the chief of the Israel numbered, after their families, after the house of their fathers, from thirty years old and upward, even unto fifty years old, every one that came in to do service of the ministry and the service of the burden in the tabernacle of the congregation, even those that were numbered of them, were eight thousand and five hundred and fourscore, according to the commandment of the Lord. They were numbered by the hand of Moses, even one according to his service, every one according to his service, and according to his burden. Thus were they numbered of him, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out the camp of every leper, and every one that hath an issue, that means that they're leaking in some way, whether it be uh, feminine leaking, or if there's pus pouring out of some orifice, get them out. And whosoever, whosoever is defiled by the dead, which means anybody that touched anything that was dead, both male and female shall ye put out, without the camp shall ye put them, that they defile not their camps in the midst whereof I dwell, meaning this must be a clean place. If I'm going to be there, there can't be any hanky-panky going on. There can't be any issuing and oozing happening around me. I want it clean. I want it pure. I want it holy. Got it? Outside the camp. Don't put that thing near me. I don't know where that thing's been. Put it outside the camp. And the children of Israel did so and put them out without the camp. As the Lord spake unto Moses, so did the children of Israel. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, when a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit, to do a trespass against the Lord, and that a person be guilty, then they shall confess their sins which they have done, and he shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof, and add unto it a fifth part thereof, and give it unto him against whom he hath trespassed. That means stealing for the most part. But there are other sins you can commit. But the one he's talking about right now is if you take something of worth, you're supposed to give it back and add a fifth part to it. Basically give it back with interest period. That's the only thing that will make you not guilty of that sin is if you repay it with interest. But 
If the man have no kinsman to recompense the trespass unto, let the trespass be recompensed unto the Lord, even to the priests, or priest. Beside the ram of, a, of the atonement, whereby an atonement shall be made for him. It's pretty simple. If they have no kinsman, then give it to the church. But you must give it one way or the other. Those people, not us. We have a different, more sophisticated way of dealing with sin, but back then they didn't have that, so this is how they handled it. And every offering of the holy things of the children of Israel, which they bring unto the priest, shall be his. And every man's hallowed things shall be his. Whatsoever any man giveth the priest, it shall be his. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, meaning if she sleeps with another man, and a man lie with her carnally, see, and it be hid from the eyes of the, her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with a manner, and the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah, which is a container of barley meal. And he shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon. Don't season it. For it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. See, ladies, and you thought that it was bad. All he has to do is cook for you if he catches you screwing around. But know this. If you're a screwer arounder, you're going to get yours one way or another. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel. And of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hands the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by saying an oath and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, if thou, shalt, if thou hast gone not aside, to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband. Be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people. And when the Lord doth make thy thighs to rot, your thighs will rot, and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels, and to make thy belly to swell, and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. That's pretty gruesome, ladies. Keep to your husband. <clears throat> Don't be a you-know-what. Stay with your husband, or your thighs will rot and your belly will swell. And that's not a pretty sight. Diego! What's happening, buddy? And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. And the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hands and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. 
and the priest shall take an handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar. Afterwards shall cause the woman to drink of the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass, that if she be defiled, and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the cur curse shall enter into her, and become bitter, and her belly shall, shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed, meaning she'll be given the pleasure of birthing a child. Now, that's a pretty severe punishment for cheating on your husband. But let me tell you what, in those days, marriage was considered a sanctuary. It was considered holy. And if you defiled it, you were breaking the bond made between you and your father, God. That's how precious marriage should be. Unfortunately, this day and age is not that anymore, and people don't revere, don't, um, don't respect their marriage as they used to. But I think it, it, it wouldn't hurt people to go back to that a little bit. Because the relationship between a man and a woman is a very hard one to secure a real relationship not I mean lots of people get married that don't have no business being married but there are people that become a team and they work off of each other and they confide in each other and they care for each other and that should be esteemed it should be held in high esteem why it's not I don't know this is the law of jealousies when a wife goeth aside unto another instead of her husband, and is defiled, or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Now, sometimes a woman doesn't do anything wrong, but she's so pretty that a man can't help himself but think she's doing something wrong. This is covered also. And by the way, if she hasn't done anything wrong, the Lord will not cause her to have any punishment. There will be no bitter water that swells her belly or rots her thighs. She will be free and conceive. Then shall the man be guiltless from his iniquities, from that particular iniquity. And this woman shall bear her iniquity. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of the Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree. From the kernels even to the husk. Don't eat grapes if you're a Nazarite, if you've taken that vow. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall be no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come in no dead body. Come at no dead body, meaning he shouldn't touch anything dead. He shall not make himself unclean for his father, or for his mother, or for his brother, or for his sister, when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation he is holy unto the Lord. Meaning that if someone in his immediate family dies, he's not allowed to partake of the 
burial, burial c- ceremony. He can't touch anything dead. And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles, or two young pigeons, to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, can't go inside, and the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering, and make an atonement for him, for that he sinned by the dead, and shall hallow his head the same day. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation, and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering, but the days that were before shall be lost, because his separation was defiled. Meaning there's a certain uh, amount of days, a certain number of time that you're supposed to be separated to the Lord. And if you don't make it before something dead touches you, then all that time you've spent is gone. You have to start over and start those that number again, that amount of time again of being separated to the Lord, of being holy unto the Lord, of being hallowed by the Lord. That is the law of the Nazarite. We'll get into that some other time, what that means, the, the vow of the Nazarite. But it is very important to note that if you take that vow, you should take it very seriously because the Lord is watching, and he does take it very seriously. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb, there'll never be another ewe, of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil and their meat offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering and he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread the priest shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave his head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And his holy, and is holy, this is holy for the priest with the wave breast and heave shoulder after the Nazarite may drink wine. So after all that's done, then he can partake. <laughs> Again, this is the law of the Nazarite, who hath vowed of his offering unto the Lord for his separation, beside that that his hand shall get, according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. Whatever he made that promise, whatever promise he made, whatever vow he agreed to, you better do it, because if you don't, Something bad's coming. It's better to not vow at all. You shouldn't make swears. You shouldn't promise things you know you can't keep. But if you do make that that, that very serious Nazarite type of vow, you better keep it or die trying because the alternative is worse. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying on this wise, Ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.
and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And it came to pass, on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle, and had anointed it, and sanctified it, and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them, and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes, and were over them that were numbered, offered, and they brought their offerings before the Lord, six covered wagons, and twelve oxen, a wagon for two of the princes, and for each one an ox, and they brought them before the tabernacle, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take it of them, that they may be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt give them unto the Levites, to every man according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen, and gave them unto the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon according to their service, and four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Merari according to their service. Under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest, can't say Ithamar without keeping the lisp going. But unto the sons of Goeth he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. He didn't give them anything. They were left out, because their burden was a burden commanded by God, and no matter what, they have to do it. And the princes offered for a dedicating of the altar in the day that was anointed, that it was anointed. Even the priests offered their offerings before the altar. And the Lord said unto Moses, They shall offer their offerings, each prince on his day, for the dedicating of the altar. And he that offered his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Amenadab, of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver charger, which is a container. The weight thereof was an hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, meaning it was valued at the same as the ways and measures deemed it valuable. Both of them were full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one spoon of ten shekels of gold, full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amenadab. And on the second day, Nathaniel, the son of Zur, prince of Issachar, did offer. He offered for his offering one silver charger, the weight whereof was an hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one spoon of gold of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of a peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year, and a partridge in a pear tree. Whew. This was the offering of Nathaniel, the son of Zur. And on the third day, Eliab, the son of Helen, prince of the children of Zebulun, did offer. His offering was one silver charger, the weight whereof was an hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels. After the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour, and mingled with oil for the meat offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Eliab, the son of Helen. And on the fourth day, Elizer, the son of Shadur, who was French, Shadir, Prince of the children of Reuben did offer. 
His offering was one silver charger of the weight of a hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl, seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of flour, fine flour, mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels, full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for burnt offerings, one kid of the goats for a sin offering and for a sacrifice of a peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Eliza, the son of Shadir. And on the fifth day, Shelemiel, the son of Jerishada, prince of the children of Simeon, did offer. His offering was one silver charger, the weight whereof was an hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year, and for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Shelemiel, the son of Jerishadai. <coughs> On the sixth day, Eliasif, the son of Duel, who was also French, prince of the children of Gad, offered. His offering was the same thing. silver charger of the weight of an hundred and thirty shekels, a silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one gold spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Elias, the son of Duel. On the seventh day, Elishama, the son of Aminahud, uh, 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 Amahud, the prince of the children of Ephraim, offered. His offering was two, no, one silver charger. The weight thereof was an hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one golden spoon of ten shekels full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year, for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats of a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of the Lashama, the son of Emmahud. And on the eighth day offered Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur, prince of the children of Manasseh. His offering was, you guessed it, one silver charger of the weight of an hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mingled with oil, for a meat offering, one golden spoon, ten shekels, full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb, of the first year, for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats, for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of a peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Gamaliel, son of Pedazur, 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 Pedazur. On the ninth day, Abidon, the son of Gedeoni, prince of the children of Benjamin, offered. His offering was the same thing. I can't read it again. I'm going to skip it. If it says anything different, I'll say it. On the tenth day, Ahazur, the son of Amishadi, prince of the children of Dan, offered his offerings, and it was, you guessed it, the same. On the eleventh day, Pegiel, the son of Akron, prince of the children of Asher, offered, same thing. On the twelfth day, I feel like I've heard this song. Ahira, the son of Enon, prince of the children of Naphtali, offered. Same thing. This was the dedication of the altar 
in the day when it was anointed by the princes of Israel, twelve chargers of silver, twelve silver bowls, twelve spoons of gold, each charger of silver weighing an hundred and thirty shekels, each bowl seventy. All the silver vessels weighed two thousand and four hundred shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. The golden spoons were twelve, full of incense, weighing ten shekels apiece. After the shekel of the sanctuary, all the gold of the spoons was an hundred and twenty shekels, and all the oxen for the burnt offering were twelve bullocks, the rams twelve, the lambs of the first year twelve, with their meat offerings, the kids of the goats for a sin offering twelve. And all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offering were twelve, and four bullock, the rams sixty, the he-goats sixty, the lambs of the first year sixty. This was the dedication of the altar after it was anointed. And now you know where the twelve days of Christmas song comes from. This is where it came from. This was its inspiration. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubims, and he spake unto him. This is God himself speaking. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. And Aaron did so, and he lighted the lamps thereof over against the candlestick as the Lord commanded Moses. And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof was beaten work, according unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses. So he made the candlesticks. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from anointing, uh, excuse me, from among the children of Israel, and cleanse them. And thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of purifying upon them, and let them shave all their flesh, and let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. Then let them take a young bullock with his meat offering, even fine flour mingled with oil, and another young bullock shalt thou take for a sin offering. And thou shalt bring the Levites before the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together. And thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks, and, there, and thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord, to make an atonement for the Levites. And thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron, and before his sons, and offer them for an offering unto the Lord. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. And after that shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for an offering. For they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel, instead of such as open every womb, even instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel, have I taken them unto me. The Levites are mine. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. And I have taken the Levites for all their firstborn of the children of Israel. And I have given the Levites as a gift unto Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel, 
to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel. When the children of Israel come nigh unto the sanctuary, and Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites according unto all the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did the children of Israel unto them. And the Levites were purified, and they washed their clothes, and Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord, and Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that went the Levites in to do the service in the tabernacle of the congregation before Aaron and before his sons, as the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is it that belongeth unto the Levites from twenty and five years and old and upward. They shall go in and wait upon the service of the tab tabernacle of the congregation, and from the age of fifty years shall cease waiting upon the service thereof. Meaning from twenty-five to fifty they have to work. And when they're fifty they can retire. And shall serve no more but shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge, and shall do no service. Thou shalt do unto the Levites touching their charge. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. In the first month of the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season do the Passover. In the fourteenth day of this month at evening, ye shall keep it as his appointed season, according to all the rites of it, and according to all the ceremonies thereof, shall ye keep it. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month at evening in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man, that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day, and those men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back, that we may not offer an offering unto the Lord in his appointed season among the children of Israel? Question mark. Meaning they ended up somehow touching a dead body, and now they can't go in and do their thing. And they're asking, what should we do? And Moses said unto them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you, or of your posterity, that means your children, shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. The fourteenth day of the second month at evening shall they keep it, and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. Meaning it don't matter what the problem is, you got to keep the Passover. There's no excuses. <laughs> but the man that is clean and is not at a, in a journey and forbeareth to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season that man shall bear his sins. No excuses. Doesn't matter if you're overseas in a war. Doesn't matter if you're covered with dead bodies or tattoos of 666 all over your body. You keep the Passover. You keep it and you bring your offering. There's no excuses. And if you do miss it, you will bear the sins that you are asking for forgiveness for. And if a stranger so shall sojourn among you, and will keep the Passover unto the Lord according to the ordinances of the Passover and according to the manner thereof, 
so shall he do. Ye shall have one ordinance, both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. Passover is Passover. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Passover is Passover, and you keep it. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at evening there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. That was God sitting on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holiest of Holies, in the tabernacle of the congregation. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then, after the children of Israel sojourned, after they journeyed, sorry, and in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. Wherever the cloud was, that's where they pitched. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. They stayed right where they were. And so it was. When the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents, they stayed inside, and according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And so it was, when the cloud abode from even until the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night, that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. So if it went up at night, they left at night. If it went up in the daytime, they left in the daytime. But as long as it was there, they stayed put inside their tents. Or whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. Got the idea? At the commandment of the Lord they rested in the tents, and at the commandment of the Lord they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow burr, 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 with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Burr, 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 burr. And if they blow but once burr, with one trumpet, then the princes which were at the heads of the thousands, which were the heads of the thousands of Israel's, <coughs> shall gather themselves unto thee. And when you blow an alarm, <coughs> the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, they shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. <coughs> And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets. And they shall be to you for an ordinance, even throughout your generations. And if you go to war in the land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. And you shall be remembered before the Lord your God. And ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, 
that they may be to you for a memorial before the Lord, before your God. I am the Lord, your God. And it came to pass on the twentieth day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from the, off the tabernacle of the testimony, and the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they first took their journeys according to the commandments of the Lord by the hand of Moses. In the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah according to their armies, and over his host was Nashon the son of Amenadab. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Issachar was Nathaniel the son of Zur. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Zebulun was Elab the son of Helen. And the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari set forward, bearing the tabernacle. And the standard of the camp of Reuben set forward according to their armies. And over his host was Eliezer, the son of Shadir, who is French. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Simeon was Shelemiel, the son of Jerushadi. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Gad was Eliasaf, the son of Duel, who was also French. And the Kohathites set forward, bearing the sanctuary, and the other did set up the tabernacle against they came. Let me read that again. And the other did set up the tabernacle against they came. That doesn't sound right. And the standard of the camp of the children of Ephraim set forward according to their armies. And over his host was Elishama, the son of Amihud. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Manasseh was Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was Abidon, the son of Gideoni. Gideoni up! To the east side. And the standard of the camp of the children of Dan set forward, which was the reward of all the camps throughout their hosts. And over his host was Ehizer, uh, ah, Ahizer, 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 the son of Amishadi. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Asher was Pegiel, the son of Akron. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Naphtali was Ihari, I Ihara, the son of Enon. Thus were the journeyings of the children of Israel according to their armies when they set forward. And Moses said unto Hobab, Hobab, the son of Ragiel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. We are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come, thou with us. He's talking to his father-in-law. Come thou with us. Now, when you read a little further, you're going to find out that Moses' father-in-law was a little bit controlling. He was a little bit, you know, uh, full of bad advice. He would give Moses advice, and Moses would do it, and it wouldn't work out so well for everyone else and so this goes on for some time and they're going to have to kind of get rid of him but for a little while he tried his best to be a good son-in-law to his father-in-law and kept him by his side which ended up not being so smart but we'll find out later on come thou with us and we will do thee good for the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel and he said unto him I will not go but I will depart on mine own land to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be, that the goodness of the Lord shall do unto us the same will we do unto thee. 
We'll take good care of you, just like God takes care of us if you'll come. Be our eyes and ears. Come hang out with us. That's what he's saying here. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day, and when they went out of the camp, and it came to pass, when the ark set forward, that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Mm, don't be a complainer. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tebarah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And that place is there to this day, I would imagine. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. See? No matter how good you get it, somebody's going to screw it up for you. And there's a mixed multitude of people here. And for some reason, they go a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Oh, wish we were back in bondage in Egypt so we could have all that good food. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. You know, the manna that was provided by God on a daily basis for you to eat for free? That manna? Yes. <clears throat> you know what they say, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the manna. Or something like that. And the manna was as coriander seed and color thereof as the color of delium. I don't know what color that is, but it's probably gross. And the people went about and gathered it in the grounds and ground it into mills or beat it into mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it also. That's when the manna came at night. Early morning, right before daylight, when the when the ground gets wet. So when they woke up, there was food all around for them to eat. Provided every day by God. And then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families. Every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. How can these people be such bickerers? I'm giving them everything they need to survive. We're on a journey. We're not supposed to be eating well every day. We got to get where we're going first before the milk and honey start flowing. Jesus, buckle up. Have a little backbone. We'll get there. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? What have I done, Lord, that, that you don't find pleasing? And why are you afflicting your servant? Thou hast laid the burden of all the, this people upon me. I have to take care of all these people, me by myself. Have I conceived all these people? Are they my children? No. Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the suckling child, unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. Whence should I have flesh to give unto all these people? 
for they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal with it, uh, if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of a hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee and bear this burden with you. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. You see, God had put a Spirit on Moses, to give him the power to bear all of these people. And yet Moses couldn't do it. He couldn't handle it. It was too much for him. And he complained about it. So God says, well, bring 12 people, or whatever the number was, I forgot now. Bring them down, and I'll split your spirit among them so you don't have to bear it alone. Aw. And say thou unto the people, sanctify yourselves against the morrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. And ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out of your nostrils, I'll feed you and feed you and feed you until you can't eat any more. And it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people among whom I am are six hundred thousand footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh and they may eat the whole month. I hope you choke on it. Why? Why, God, did you take us out of Egypt? We were so well fed. We were beat, yeah, we were slaves, yeah, but we were well fed. Now we're free and we got to do it ourselves. Imagine that. They've been gone for a year, and they're whining about being in Egypt. What kind of weakness do these people possess that they can't see that God just freed them and made them whole? Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Question mark. Shall we just kill everything so that they can eat? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Have I not done enough for you? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and set them around about in the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto them and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy and it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, and they did not cease, constantly prophesying. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle and they prophesied in the camp. They stayed in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad, do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, 
enviest thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? And Moses gat him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. And when he went forth, a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp. That means that they were right in the middle of two bodies of water. There was a day's journey on either side to the sea. And it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. A cubit is about a foot and a half. So, three feet high, full of quails, little birds, dead birds, laying everywhere, three feet high. And the people stood up all that day, and all that night, and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, which is a container. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. They were fat and happy now. They got flesh to eat. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with every great, with a very great plague, probably the bird flu. I'm just guessing. And he called the name of the place, hmm, Kibroth Havata. Kibroth Hatava. That's it. Kibroth Hatava. Because there they buried the people that lusted. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Havava unto Hezeroth and abode at Hezeroth. Goodness gracious. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Well, it's good to know. We started talking about it before you told us about it, but okay, we'll go with it. They spoke against Moses because of an Ethiopian woman that he married. Because he married an Ethiopian woman. And the, it, apparently they were racist. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all mine house? With him... I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Meaning he can't see God per se, but he can see something that resembles him, a similitude of the Lord. Why is this? Because if you see God, you die. <clears throat> so God chooses a form that's similar enough that God can present it to Moses. So a similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas! My Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Well, let her not be as one dead, 
of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. After that, let her be received again. She ran her mouth and basically spit in my face by saying you were not worthy to be followed because I speak with you. She basically spit in my face and you want me to just let her off? No, let her suffer for seven days and then I'll heal her. She'll find out who the Lord is. And Miriam was shut out from the camp even seven days. And the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And after the people removed from Hezeroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Every Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by commandment of the Lord, sent from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were the names of the tribe of Reuben, Shemua and the sons of Zechur, the son uh, of the tribe of Simeon, Shephet, the son of Horai, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jepuna, of the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshe, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi, of the tribe of Joseph, namely, of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali, of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, of the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vos v Vopshi, Voshi, Vop, she, Vop, she, of the tribe of Gad, Gil, son of Mekhi. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshea to the son of Nun, Jehoshua. That's a very similar name to Joshua, or Yeshua or Jehovah or all of those names are similar. Yehoshua, that's a very sacred name, which is why it's pointed out here. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountains and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether it be wood therein, or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first stripe or first ripe grapes the the they first getting ripe on the vine so it was uh you like whatever season i guess fall would be when the grapes are growing the, the best right before summer right after summer whatever so they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of zen to rehob 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 as men Come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Heman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. 
And they came unto the brook of Ishol, Ishkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, that they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of pomegranates and of the figs. Now I want you to imagine, this is one cluster of grapes. Have you ever had grapes before? You ever pull them out and you got a cluster of them? This one cluster of grapes was bore between two men on a staff. That's how big they were. Big, big grapes. And the pomegranates and the figs. The place was called the Brook of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it flowed with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw children of Anak there. Now the children of Anak were giants. But these people, these men are going to lie to Moses. They're going to embellish the truth. They're going to say that they were like grasshoppers to these men. Now, they were big men, but they were not unbeatable, as you'll soon find out. But they're trying to tell Moses that they should go around because this, these people, these children of Anak, they're bad dudes, and we're terrified of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Malachites dwell in the land in the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites the Hittites and the Jamorites, or Amorites, are also the people God told Joshua to kill. You'll find that out later. We'll get into that. They're not people, by the way. They're not human. Amorites. The Hittites. Possibly the Jebusites. Definitely the Anakites. Dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites, not to be confused with Kenites, the Canaanites, people of Canaan, dwell by the sea by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are all well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They brought up an evil report from the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying to the land, through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. That's not true. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And they we, there we saw giants, the son of Anak, which come of giants, and were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. And so were... So we were in their sight. Man. We look like grasshoppers to them. They're that big. That's not true either. And all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept at night. They were terrified. I mean, they just got word back that there's men out there that make them look like grasshoppers. They could stomp on them and kill them. That's pretty scary. And Moses is saying, we're going in there tomorrow. or whenever, I'm paraphrasing. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses again and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Oh, you sad people. And that's where we're going to stop for today. Let's 
let it be known, O oh, you children of little faith, that when God puts you somewhere, he puts you there with all the things considered, that you might learn something and become something. He doesn't do it out of hand. He doesn't send you to slaughter as uh, sheep to wolves. He sends you to master and to control your environment. Let it be known that the Lord loves you and he cares about what's going on in your life. And when he rescues you from Egypt and brings you to the land of milk and honey, that he fully intends for you to gain control of the situation and have it. So button your lip and quit all your bitching and whining and complaining and worrying about going back to being a slave again and let the Lord do his job so that you can be a free people. Be strong. Be powerful in who you are. And know that the Lord has your back. He has mine. He has yours. And with that, please take a moment and hit that subscribe button. Press the bell icon so you'll get notifications of when I'm going to be here. Smash that like button like it owes you money. God knows it owes me some. Share this video with somebody you love. Better yet, share it with somebody you don't love. Bring them into the fold. Make them part of the family. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Leave a comment down below. Question me, curse me, bless me, challenge me, confound me. Throw me off my game. Throw yourself off your own game. As long as you're thinking, that's what I want. Critical thought from your brain. And if you like this ministry and you think we're doing God's work here and you would like to be part of that and you'd like to help us grow, please take a moment and go to paypal.me slash Band. Every little bit helps and it's greatly appreciated. Your support, your backing up the things that you love and helping it grow and being part of it. This is your ministry as much as it is mine, so won't you do that? Take a moment and help us out. And I greatly appreciate the support. With that, I will take your questions and comments. How did you like the show? What went on that you found impressive in this story? Let me read the comments and see what I missed. Headed out to Olive Garden. The book of Numbers is a great book. I read it once by myself, but I'm really enjoying it, Jake. Thank you, sir. I greatly appreciate that. Sorry I lost a connection for a few. Lost internet, but I'm back. All right. Well, here I am, still here, still preaching. What do you got to say now? Is there anybody here? Oh, yeah, there's four people here. <laughs> I hope it was enjoyable. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you understood what I was getting at. I hope you saw what was happening here, knowing that the people, even though God is basically feeding them by hand, they're still complaining. They never stopped. They have a lustful, evil spirit about them, and it just keeps going. No matter what God does, it's not good enough. And it causes a lot of problems. And it's been from the beginning of time until now, still the same story. God gives to man, and man starts complaining about it. God tries to make it better. God tries to do good by man. Man starts sinning and starts lusting and starts going against God. And then God destroys everything and starts over. This is the story that's been happening throughout the generations over and over again. Sometimes worse than others, but all times bad. Steal your mind. Know who God is. Be still and know who God is. I enjoyed it. I am also enjoying lasagna. Sounds delicious. I'm going to enjoy some sleep. That's what I'm going to enjoy because i got to work in the morning. I know, I know, I know. Everybody else does too. It's new for me. I wish I had a big old fat bowl of lasagna, though. I ate a piece of rib earlier today, but dang if I ain't hungry again. I might have to go to town and get something to eat before I go to bed. Yeah, I'll probably just wait till tomorrow. Eat on my way to work. 
I am working at a screen printing shop. I'm making t-shirts, mm -hmm. making signs. And I suppose I'll be doing that for the foreseeable future. God only knows. Tomorrow I should be getting my microphones in. And I bought two microphones. Great exegesis, Jake. Thank you, sir. Nice word. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it also. Especially the last part. The first part was a little rough, but we got through it. I was sweating some of those names, man. Oof. Great job, Jake. Thank you, honey. Thank you for supporting me and backing me up. You mean the world to me. I hope you know that. I hope you know that you're everything to this ministry. It would not exist without you. So rejoice in that knowledge. And know that I have your back. I mean that. The book of Numbers applies mostly to the Jews, especially when it comes to the laws. Yes, it does. It is more especially not just the Jews, but the people of the tabernacle, the 12 tribes, the original people that were in and about the tabernacle of the congregation. Does not apply to the Gentiles, does not apply after Jesus' death, but it does apply to them, and it's worth knowing because now you know how God works, and you know what's expected of people up until the time that things changed. It is the fourth book of the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five, in case you're wondering. Dude, what's the next book? Deuteronomy, man. I say this because many atheists will point out these laws are immoral in a way this in a way to discredit God's word. Yes, I know. Dude, Deuteronomy, man. I said that. Amen. Yes, people often point the Old Testament to say that this is bad God. This is the vengeful God. No, no. Read it again, and you'll find out that man instigates every time God's wrath is kindled. It's because of man's doing, not God's. God is not a vengeful God. He's a reactionary God. He reacts to what man does. He's trying his best to do something good for his people, and they are trying their best to deny him and make him mad and go against him. It's not God's fault. It's man's fault. It has been over and over and over. Men are evil, not God. We just experienced that twice in this book. Three times, actually. Four times, if you count, when he mentioned Moses, I mean, Aaron's first two sons that brought the strange fire. That was at the beginning there. That was the first of four times. And then there was the lusting after the food and the whining about going back to Egypt and the, you know, just on and on and on and on and on. And Moses whining like he can't control everybody. And God set 72 men to share the blessing that he put on Moses, that Shekinah glory that no one could even look at his face. He was so bright. He split that up took it from Moses and gave it to the other people. In chapter 16, which we will read next week, it will talk about the revolt of Korah and his sons. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get there. There's a lot of revolting going on. A lot of bad people. This last thing we just read was the, the spies that he sent out came back and told them lies. And we'll find out later on that those were lies. But he's not telling the truth because he doesn't want to go in battle. These two two spies. 
but they're going to find out that where God sends them, they're going to go. Korra was not innocent. None of them people are innocent. None of them are. They're all evil. Hope you have a great work day, Jake. I hope I do too. I don't like to work too hard. It's painful. But thank you. I hope you do too. Yay! So far, though, I'm enjoying it. It's not a bad job. It's not too hard on me. A lot of jobs I've done in the past have been too hard on me, but this one doesn't appear to be. So far, I've been able to handle it well and not be utterly exhausted by the time I'm done and actually have a little energy to do something afterwards. The, the jobs I'm used to doing, the construction work, by the time that day's over, I'm done. I might not even make it in the house. I might fall asleep in the truck. That tiring. But this job appears to be handleable. And I enjoy the work. It's not hard. It's a little monotonous, but I'm good at, I'm good with monotonous. I can do it. Repetition, you know. Thank you, Jake. Love you true. I love you too, honey. With all my heart. I really do. Know that. You are right here. Man, a little down here. No, I'm just kidding. When God commands the people of Israel, the destruction of the other nations, isn't that a contradiction of thou shalt not kill? Is that genocide or not? No, sir, it is not. And no, sir, it is not a contradiction of thou shalt not kill, because war is not criminal homicide. The word in Hebrew is fonyance, that's to lie in wait that is uh what uh help me out kevin murder in the third degree is that what it is um it's 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 trying to kill someone it's premeditated murder is what the word kill means k-i-l-l -L. in war you're fighting for something it's not the same thing it doesn't apply to the same rules that's why soldiers are not guilty of murder because they didn't murder anybody. They were following a commandment set by their general who is in control of the war for a purpose. Now, the wars that we fight today are not legitimate wars, but the wars that God fought were because he was fighting against people that were not human beings or people that were corrupted in a, a celestial way. Uh, you have to understand why God tells these people to be killed. It's not because they're people or because they're in the wrong place. It's because they're corrupted by seed that doesn't belong on this earth. <clears throat> and that was a big problem in those days because the fallen angels came down and mated with people and had offspring and many of them. And also, by the way, God created this world. He can destroy it if he wants to. It belongs to him. So no, it's not genocide. It's not homicide. It's God's property. If he wants to smash it to bits, that's his business. That includes us. You can't do it, but he can. Also, have you ever heard the nomenclature, do as I say, not as I do? God said, thou shalt not kill. Doesn't mean he has to abide by it. He's the one that's given the orders. All right, thanks, Kev. First degree murder is premeditated murder. Second degree murder is done when it is reckless. Third degree murder is when it is done when somebody commits a felony and that person dies. And there's also different degrees of murder, not just in first, third, second, third, but also like a, a crime of passion may be uh, judged differently than a crime of violence or a crime of hatred. You may be like in, in the throes of a love triangle and end up killing somebody out of passion. And that has to be judged a little differently than regular murder because of the nature of what's causing it. And then there's war and things like hit men, things that, where there's no malice involved, it's just a process of what has to happen. 
okay? I know that's a little hard to under explain, and it may be a little bit of a cop-out that I'm leaving it at that, but war does not have murder. When a country declares war, then killing the other side is legal. I say this because in the Old Testament, the Lord orders the killing of every woman and child, especially in the times of Joshua, in Judges. Why women and children as well? Because they too have the seed of the corrupt. They don't belong on this planet. They're not supposed to be here. You have to understand why they're warring. It's not about property. It's about righteousness. These people have sinned against God in the worst way. Man, woman, child, and animal, by the way. They're not even supposed to leave the animals alive. And in that case, when that I forget which group of people it is, but they were practicing bestiality, and they were spreading their seed among animals. And that is a no-no. And God said, wipe them all out, man, woman, child, and animal. Kill them all. Wrong. Murder by passion and self-defense legalized the murder. Gotcha. Well, I'm not wrong. I said they had to be judged differently. I didn't say what the punishment was. It does have to be judged differently because it's a different thing. Great insight, Jake. Yes, sir. There are reasons why God sends men into war. Okay? It's not just out of a, a nebula. It's not nebulous. There's a reason for it. And you have to dig sometimes to find that reason, but it's there. And I will try my best when we get to the place where all the wars happen to point out why they're going to war. And know that in every case, it's because the people on the bad side have gone against God in a way that's irreconcilable, in a way that God can't save them. They've, they've went too far over the deep end. <laughs> Some of them worship false gods. Some of them are practicing uh, Moloch worship where they pass their babies through fire. Some of them are practicing bestiality. Some of them are not human, like the uh, uh, Amorites. They were not human beings. They were part something else. On and on and on and on. And some of them, like in the Tower of Babel, had uh, aspirations of heavenly domination. That's why God scattered all the people and separated all the language so they couldn't communicate. Because if they left to their own devices, could have done anything. And that's bad. Great insight, Kevin. You know your stuff. Well, he ought to. He's a lawyer. That's why I appealed to him, because I don't really know. I just, I'm kind of guessing. I mean, I know some things, but I don't have a law degree to back it up, is what I'm saying. He does, and I will call on it. I will appeal to higher authority. Moses was God's chosen one, and he was a great prophet. Yes, he was. And God even said, anybody else that prophesies, you'll get it in a dream or a vision. But Moses, I will appear to as close to in person as I possibly can and will talk to him face to face, mouth to mouth. You don't get that, but Moses gets that. And he said, I will, I will present a similitude. You can't actually look at God because if you do, you die. You know, you can't see God in the flesh. But I will show him something that's close enough that he can approximate an image to know who he's talking to. My friend, who is an Orthodox and practicing Jew, always talks about Moses with me, and he speaks about him in a great way. Well, he was very revered among the Jews. <laughs> Even the... Uh, the Ishmael people, uh, what are they called? The Muslims. Even the Muslims revere Moses and Jesus, by the way. They say, peace be upon him. I'm just saying. 
they are not the correct religion, but they are not as bad as people have demonized them to be. In fact, they got a few good things going for them. The way they handle their women, for one thing. I'm just saying, ladies, sorry. Maybe you should be a little more modest. Recognize where you belong and all that good stuff. Maybe you shouldn't have so much freedom that it causes you to turn inside out and go crazy, hog wild. Maybe there should be a hierarchy to things. God, man, woman, child, country, you know. That is, after all, the way God designed it to be. Maybe there's some purpose behind that. Maybe you should think about that before telling me how it is. Because I know how it is. You better recognize. Power zoom right to the moon. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Especially because he came down with the Ten Commandments. God gave him the law. Christianity is the correct religion. Not Islam. That's what I said. I'm with you there. But they do have a few things right. They just don't have that thing right. A matter of fact, it's basically the same religion except for one detail, and it happens to be a very important detail. But for the most part, you got to understand that uh, Isaac and Ishmael were brothers. They came from the same father. They went in two different directions, but they were the same family. Same religion formed both ideals, which became the two different things, Christianity and Muslim, or Islam, whatever you want to call it. So it's not far off. It's just off. And some of them know it too. And they come around. But then you get religion involved. And religion is the downfall of everything. Christ said a, a house divided cannot stand. And what is religion except for a division of the ideas? Religion bad. God good. Remember that. Don't fall into the traditions of men. They will lead you nowhere but to hell. That's why you will never hear me call myself any type of Christian. I am non-denominational. I have no denomination. I belong to no one but God. He is my leader. Period. No church. No organization. No masthead. No establishment. Down with the patriarchy. Just give me my father. That's all I need. And in this world, I will survive one way or another. Till I don't. Then I'll be gone, and it won't matter. But it'll matter to you, so pay attention. I'm only here for a little while. And I love you guys, and it's time for me to go watch some news and fall asleep. So... Take care of each other. Be passionate. Be strong-willed. Be imaginative. Be meek. Be honorable. Be courageous. Be courteous. Be supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. But most of all, above all things, if you never learn anything else in this world, know that you should be...